I'm conscious that the speakers were kept to a very short time limit, and I'm sorry that their excellent presentations had to be somewhat curtailed, but I hope that in the Q&A now they'll have a chance to come back and make some additional points. So this is the opportunity now for you to participate uh, in terms of asking questions and making short contributions. Uh, your contributions have to be about a minute or so. <laughs> You were talking about the abortion and the what was almost like you've got the anti-abortionists who are up to the right wing sort of fundamentalists. But you've also got what is almost like a pro-choice group, but it's very very different sort of choice. But they're like pro how do they how do they reconcile the pro-choice or like pro-gender choice against the anti choice groups, because that eventually they're gonna clash with their ideology there. I wonder how they're going to reconcile that, ultimately. I will leave that. How will they reconcile Are you talking about the pro-choice women's groups, you mean? Well, there was, the anti-abortion there, anti there was the anti-abortion groups, oh, and the, groups. And the ones who wanted to be, who just wanted to have my own children. That was a sort of choice, but how, and eventually that's going to clash, because it's not, it's not compatible. I wonder how that eventually that would, yeah, they're going to clash, because it's... One of them is completely anti any abortion, and one of them wants a certain range of abortions, but not others. Um, they want female abortion, but that's pro abortion and anti abortion, and they're not going to. How do they reconcile that as a group if they're, if they're allying together? I, this is, this is, I have to say, this is something that's unravelling at the moment, and I'm not quite sure what's going on because of the kind of alliances that are being formed. What I have been able to see is that uh, you have a push by somebody who is part of the pro-Christian right lobby um, who's using the serious crime bill to push for a ban on sex selection abortion. Now, sex selection abortion is a real po problem. It's a huge, huge problem of affidavit. So they're not allying themselves with the... The ones who want it, they're unbiased on themselves with the people who don't want it. They're, they're, they're wanting to ban the idea, oh. but it's a way into eroding the rights on abortion. Yes, I see right. that. That's what's yes. happening. So what we're seeing is the Christian right and some women's groups, and I have to say one, of the, the, yes. one of the situations that we're in at the moment, and, and I think it's part of the kind of gender mainstreaming issues that we have as feminists got to tackle because we've got ourselves into some real problem areas there. And the way in which the state has adopted women's rights issues. So we have an, a situation where the state itself is using Asian women's rights as a way of um, yes. um, uh, basically criminalizing, okay? Now, I'm not against criminalizing issues that need criminalizing. Yes. I want to make clear that, um, you know, violence against women are very, very, um, are, are criminal acts. But here in this situation, what you have is a Christian right lobby pushing for sex, a ban on sex selection abortions, supported by women's groups are who are not political, yes. who are pro-choice, but who say that sex selection abortion must be uh, dealt with. One, there's no evidence for that. The evidence that does exist comes from the right-wing think tank, anti-immigrant uh, think tank, yeah. Migration Watch. Now, what it's doing, looking into this issue, is anyone's guess. We're trying to work out what the hell's going on there. <laughs> Nevertheless, here we are with an anti-immigration uh, think tank, Migration Watch, pushing for a ban on sex selection, abortion, in alliance with um, the pro Christian right, pro life Christian right, yeah. and interestingly supported by, by, by all the Muslim fundamentalists, um, by fund Muslim, Hindu, Sikh fundamentalists. So, what you see in a sense is an alliance to uh, ban, say, say um, sex selection abortion, which on the whole, as feminists, we would agree with. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Except be this alliance gives us real cause for concern. They're, they're leavering because in, they're fundamentalists yeah. who are trying to, we think, use this space, this, this situation and this argument to basically encroach on abortion rights yeah. of women. Yeah. 
And that's what's worrying us about this. Not that there shouldn't be state intervention if sex selection abortion is going on. The question is, what kind of state intervention? How does it work? Where's our sound evidence for it? Not just a bit of anecdotal evidence. And the anecdotal evidence that has been produced in the form of case studies actually are, are, are case studies of domestic violence and not abortion. Uh, say, okay. sex selection abortion. Oh, thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I would have to thank Mariam because she, she invited me. I'm, uh, my name is Isam Shukri. I'm from the uh, Left Worker Communist Party of Iraq. Um, and worked on secularism for such a long time. And I was an anti -war uh, in the anti-war movement in many places, including Baghdad. And we organized people for secularism in 2003, 4, 5, before the sectarian uh, uh, conflict erupted by Shia killing Sunni and vice versa. And there, there's a question, but there's also a comment I want to make. This, the secularism now is a political struggle. Uh, it's, it's not, religion now is a political movement. So political Islam, and I, I want to clarify that this is, my fight now is a political fight, and this is the fight of socialists in my view. Now, uh, in Mariam's and other, other speakers' um, uh, speeches, uh, the, there was a mention about uh, a political Islam, but there also uh, happened to, um, I happened to hear the word fundamentalism. And I believe that uh, the source of all things is the political Islamic movement. We have to be specific about that. If we, if we look at the Middle East now, there are two poles of the two poles of political Islam. This Saudi Arabia, which the the this, yes, uh, which the war, uh, the which the uh, West, and I don't know about Britain, but the West in general is flirting with, very obviously. And Obama cut his visit to India to go to Saudi Arabia to to present his condolences, and he never spoke one word about women's issues there. So you see how, how interlaced or intermingled the, the issue is. It's a, it's a political issue and also the Islamic Republic of Iran, which, you know, after the 5 plus 1 um, conference or, or uh, negotiations, it's, it's getting worse for the people of the Middle East. So we struggled for a secular government in Iraq. And we struggled for a secular government in Iran and a secular government in Lebanon. Unfortunately, the scene now is more terrible than the 2003. So I call for people to oppose political Islam and put it in, in their agenda as a socialist struggle for the working class and for the women in Iraq and in Iran and in Saudi Arabia. And, and, and unfortunately, as uh, one of the speakers said, they are knocking on the West doors because they, they, they consider all these nations as infidels. So, thank you for allowing me to, to say this, but I really sincerely think that this is a political struggle and it's so damn serious that we should all rally behind secularism and secular states everywhere in the world. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to make a contribution or ask a question to the panel? Yajin wants to make a very quick comment. So. Um, there, was, there was a slide up at the end of my presentation. Um, I'm not advocating that protest by any means. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant to go on to say was, you know, despite all the murders, despite all the, the atrocities that have happened that I listed, what has got Muslims out on the street? What we'll be getting, God knows how many are going to turn up tomorrow. But the cartoons, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, I almost swore there. Um, it, it beggars belief, it absolutely beggars belief that the massacre in Peshawar didn't mobilise them. The abduction of the girls in Nigeria didn't mobilise them. Nothing seems to mobilise the clerics or even the community as a whole, the community that I'm part of. 
and it shames me. It really does shame me. So it was just as a um, as a pointer to what will be happening also this weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There's more questions on the forum. Uh, the, the Bradford affair. Well, that was mostly, to be honest, uh, men of the Pakistani background against white women or white girls. What do we expect of the black girls? How would what is happening there? Well, I haven't heard a lot about that. Is it Rochdale and brother? Yeah, how, 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 is, it, is there expecting that it literally is only black for Pakistani men with white girls? Or do you expect there is also something about Pakistani women? Yeah. Well, Pravna and I have both worked on the child sexual exploitation cases um, that have been happening across the country. Um, it is it is not just um, white girls who have suffered at the hands of, of these men. But having said that, I am um, in agreement with Pravna on her position, which I'm sure she'll explain much better than I can, that there is an issue within Muslim communities. There is um, a hierarchy of women in which women are um, you know, more valued than, than other women. And an issue that we need to address desperately within those communities. But when you reduce what happened to those children, to the racism, we forget about the victims in that, in that discourse. Yeah. And we need to focus on what happened to the young girls. The perpetrators are in prison, but make sure that is not repeated in the lives of anyone else. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I'm absolutely sick to death of hearing that this is yet another, you know, issue of racism because I think that it's very easy to excuse what's going on in our own communities, which is not to say that we don't tackle racism when it happens. But, you know, within our own communities, we have to look at the way in which... Um, uh, the sexism is playing out, not just against black women, and by the way, that the same men who are abusing white girls are also abusing their own. Um, that That is definitely the case, and the fact that those are happening perhaps more behind closed doors than on the streets is nevertheless still a con continuity there. So that's for sure. But I think that one of the things, and I'm not very popular, and Yasmin's not very popular, even within anti-racist uh, feminist circles, when we say that actually by, by self-reflecting, we need to actually look at the way in which black men look at white women. And that there is a way, a cultural uh, normalization of white women's sexuality. And the way in which, if you just look at some of the Bollywood films, for example, and look at the portrayal of white women in those Bollywood films and how they are in the most skimpiest of clothes and most objectified sexually, you can see that there is an issue there. And so I'm saying that as part of this debate, as part of this debate about um, not just you know men abusing girls, but the way in which race plays out, the way in which race and sex plays out, the way, we, sorry, race and gender plays out, sexuality plays out, and the intersectionalities of these things are very, very important to understand and to try and unravel and explore and examine. Um, and that has to go hand in hand also with the way in which institutions fail to help these women. And, you know, one cannot allow the focus just to be on individual men and what they did to individual girls, but the way in which there was institutional complicity in all of this, and the, the way in which the police and social services dealt with this. So there's some very serious things, but I don't think we do ourselves any favors by saying that this is all just a racist conspiracy with the media and the police and everybody else, and that we shouldn't examine Asian men's response to these white girls because, you know, these ha this happens in all communities. Of course it happens in all communities, <coughs> but we also have to tackle the specificity of what's going on because until we do that, we can't address the problems, which includes looking at the way in which men view sexuality in our own communities. Thank you, sorry. Um, I worked in the media for many years for the BBC. And I'm um, bookended by the book burning in Bradford, a bit like Pragna described herself in terms of years. It was my moment of my eyes opening in Bradford when that book was being burnt, and nobody really knew why. Um, I feel like a 
massive failure personally um, on a number of fronts, but specifically that I worked with South of Black Sisters back in 1998-1999 to try and continue some films on honour killings in this country and to work on FGM stories in this country. I made big documentaries which won awards and in theory had an enormous privilege of being able to work for BBC. But um, I exhausted myself. I fought for many, many years to tell these stories about the murder of women in mainly Pakistani communities, but not only, but under the title of honor killing in this country. The grooming of girls, the uh, secret and discreet um, FGM conducted on girls, and the um, complete failure to prepare midwives, social services, doctors, for what FGM was. I had a friend who was a midwife who came across this and almost fainted when she saw it. She had no training about what FGM was in a Somali community in this country. There was a routine turning a blind eye, not just to the grooming of white girls, but to the harm being done to, as Padma said, their own, if there is such a thing. And um, I look now, I listen to the radio, I hear everybody blaming the police, blaming the social services. And I know personally that we in the media were massively to blame. I, I mean, I fought, but I lost those battles. I didn't win those battles. In the end, a lot of work just was spiked, was never aired. Stories of murder that went uninvestigated, never came to court. All of those stories, you know, have never been told. And I've noticed here, most of the people who've spoken seem to see themselves as on the left. Chris Moose mentioned that Cameron spotted him, it was a surprise, and possibly not for the right reasons. I personally feel the left totally betrayed women of ethnic minorities and also the, the white girls who are groomed, minority and majorities, in a sense it's irrelevant. They betrayed them in favor of the patriarchal agenda and especially many Labour MPs in Labour constituencies in this country turned a blind eye to, specifically, explicitly, consciously turned a blind eye to forced marriage and to all of the cultural paraphernalia that surrounded all this. So I would just um, beg for caution before, I know you've mentioned you're a socialist and uh, you believe in left-wing politics and everybody hates the Tories, but actually, this isn't really a, an issue that the left has been very good on. The left has let us down. Uh, my question is about the issue of identity, of uh, Muslim identity as a political and social kind of identity, which kind of started in the 40s by uh, I mean, started by uh, Muslim Brotherhood, I think, kind of one, in Egypt. Uh, now, we have got ISIS, which is uh, Islamic fascism, basically, a form of a horrible kind of fascism. And this fascistic movement ha ha has got the identity of Muslim. My question is, what do you think is going to happen to this political and social identity of Muslim? Should society and especially, especially the labeled Muslim population reject this social identity and political identity in mass scale, wouldn't that be uh, an end to Islamic fascism and political Islam? Because this is the identity that, uh, social and political identity which ISIS and the other Islamic movements uh, have invested on and they, they count on it to, uh, when, when it comes to international recruitment. Uh, shouldn't, my question specifically is this, isn't the answer to ISIS, obviously the military action, etc., not paying off, it had never paid off, isn't the answer to this rejection of this political and social identity by the whole society and specifically labeled Muslim population, uh, isn't that the answer? Thanks. What I'm going to do is invite each of the panel members to respond to whatever questions have been raised or any other points they want to make. So, can we start with 
Yeah. 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 The last question or any of the questions that have been yes, raised. I, I, I am very pleased that you asked that. I would like to go back. I'm coming back to your point later because I don't have much to say here. But I'm going back to my Socialist Party colleague there. I'm sorry. Is are you Socialist Party or a Communist Party in Iraq? I think if I'm messing up, Me? I apologize. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not, not you, not you. <laughs> the Communist Party of Iraq, I believe. Uh, I just wanted to make a, I mean, add a little comment to what Pratnadi already said. Uh, about the, I, I really didn't understand that comment quite. Uh, that when you were saying political Islam, fight for a political Islam, I'm getting a little bit really more worried than I was, than I was a little while ago. And I, when I was using the word fundamentalism, I was actually uh, referring to a word, uh, a term that is extremist or religious right in any religion. I'm not actually talking against Islam. Look, I say that I'm yet to be yet to be an ex-Muslim. Therefore, I have no reason to reason to say that. The, the Islamists or just Muslims can become fundamentalists and not others. I'm suggesting that the word fundamentalism is a, a common word that we uh, left feminists. I know that yes, some left politicians, especially in Bangladesh, they are very much hypocritic and I know how it likes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come to West. It's not the place that I really love to be, if I'm honest. But I know that there is a huge problem with the word political Islam. And I would really urge you not to try to give any label to this secularist struggle, which I hold strongly against fundamentalism, against any religious extremism. So that's my point. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to respond to the comment on uh, Cameron. So, um, <laughs> um, it's, we're getting applause um, often from the Conservatives and from the right. Um, we often, I would say, normally do get that applause for the wrong reasons. Um, Cameron um, is the man who um, I think is or was member of the Bullock Club, an all male, completely segregated club. Um, he is the man who um, you know has been pushing the faith cool and the multi faithist agenda like in, in, into tremendous proportions. Um, he is the man also um, who has rejected explicitly secular um, neutrality in, in matters of belief of the state. Um, so what conservatives often do, and you know I often find myself unfortunately being people like Andrew Gilligan from the Telegraph and say like, well, actually, I do agree with the principle of what, what, what that he's saying, but I do not agree with the motives of what they're, what they're saying, because um, they are opposing um, Islamism, and specifically Islamism. They don't oppose, uh, you know, political religion in the form of Anglicism or Catholicism and so on and so on. They oppose political Islam because it's the other, because it's different, because fundamentally um, they see it's like, well, basically it's these brown people, you know, pushing their agenda. We don't want that. Um, so. The really uh, the motives for which people are opposing Islamism um, are very important. Are they opposing it because they are for women's rights, for equality, for social justice, for gay rights, and for secularism, or are they just opposing it because you know they see our oh, you know the, the the Islamists are the other and the ones that they don't like because probably they have the wrong creed and the wrong color of skin. Um, yeah, to the to the person who said, you know, um, really the left has failed. Yeah, it has. That's what we've been saying for a long, long time. But that doesn't mean we vacate what we should what should be the left space. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. The the fact that we've spent a good part of this morning attacking the left, it's not because it's not because we want to abandon what should be the left space. In fact, what we want to do in, is invest it, renew it, reinvent it, so that it stands for democratic, progressive, secular, anti, 
uh, fundamentalist, you know, uh, space. Um, and it pains me, actually, it absolutely pains me to sit here and to speak in conference after conference, after meeting, after rally or whatever it is, talking about the left like this. It really pains me because this is my home. It is my home, it is where I learned, you know, how to theorize around what I felt were injustices as I was growing up, whether it was to do with racism, whether it was to do with the subjugation of women, and, and, and others. So, I'm not going to abandon this space called the left, but I am sure as hell going to be critical of each and every person who starts siding with the religious right or any other political right movement, authoritarian, fascist, religious, whatever. Um, I think it's really important that we, as the left, um, really think about what we embrace as progressive values. And again, to quote, uh, he's becoming more and more one of my heroes, uh, uh, the Indian historian Dilip Simeon, at a meeting on the Hindu right in the UK. He said, when the left embraces the right, doesn't it stop uh, deserving the badge of being the left? Um, if we want to carry on seeing ourselves as left, we better start thinking again, and that means challenging, however difficult it is, and that might mean, you know, uh, opportunists coming in and wanting to support us on all sorts of things, whether they're the anti-immigration think tank, Migration Watch, or David Cameron, or anyone else, opportunists coming in and cashing in on this. We have to be very wary of that, but I think that we do need, I still want to be part of left, broad left politics, because I stand for injustices. I stand for challenging injustices, whether it's based on race, class, gender, sexuality, or any other thing. But maybe, you know, where we need to start is looking at human rights values, secular human rights values, and defending those. Um, oh, I'm gonna make two points. Um, one following on from, um, thank you, what Pragna said um, about the left. I sit here, the daughter of a communist. Um, the left is where I learnt my activism. It's where I had my political awakenings. Women Against Fundamentalism has been mentioned this morning. And I was a member of WAF, although a late comer to the table. And if anything really broke my heart, it was the falling apart of WAF over the Moisin Beg issue. For me, that crystallised where the left failed. And it also feeds into what I was saying in my presentation about collusion, is that every time the anti-racists silence any one of us when we are challenging the fundamentalists, they are colluding with the, with, with, um, the Islamists or with other extremists. And that may be an extreme view to some, but it was um, standing on the margins, watching you know, the whole debate around Moisin Bay. Yes, he was in Guantanamo Bay, but let's not forget what he has been involved in. I mean, this is a man who thought the Taliban were the ideal, idealized Islamic society. Let's never forget that he thought taking his wife and children there was okay. Um, in terms of, to come back to Reza's point about rejecting Muslim identity and would this lead to an end to political Islam, let's follow this through. So, in terms of, of Islamism, we reject Muslim identity. For Hindutva, do we reject Hindu identity? Do we ask Christians to reject their, their Christian identity? I think we need to be cautious about throwing everything out I think wearing just the one label of I'm a Muslim and I'm nothing else is something I would say let's reject. But to ask me to reject a part of my heritage, my culture, my being, whether I practice or not is immaterial, is a really, really difficult thing and I would be extremely challenged by it. Um, and it's not something I would feel comfortable with. I want to reject all of the Islamists, all of their interpretations, all of their ideology. And I'm asking them to do something that I right now feel quite pained at even having to think about 
Maybe it is the solution, I don't know. But on right that, now it just feels difficult. Sorry. On that point, if you compare oh, say the excuse, excuse me, so, just just wait. Yeah. Let um Alain uh Hiya. Um I just want to answer that as well. I mean the idea of a mass or apostasy is not gonna fix anything. I mean when I became an ex-Muslim, it took me years to be able to deal with it. It's not just, uh, it comes with baggage. It comes because being a Muslim is not just practicing Islam. It, it filters into every part of your life, almost. I don't think that it would, I don't think it would solve it. I just think it's a lot to ask from people. And although I think in an idealistic way, it'd be nice. But no, um, I wouldn't ever want my mom to feel like she would have to leave it because some Muslim must can't sort his head out. Um, I want to just say a few things about um, the schools I didn't speak about. Yasmin spoke about it. I think one of the most important thing with um, one of the most important things with uh, Islamic schools, one of the most biggest problems, is this idea of segregation. And it's not just Islamic schools that are guilty of this. Uh, there are Jewish schools as well in which the children have almost no contact with outsiders. There are some. Very extreme examples where Jewish children are learn not learning how to speak English. And um, also, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that with uh, private faith schools, they have a lot of control over how they can expel the children. And so I do know of cases of girls who were expelled for being lesbians, and, um, even if they were very young and they didn't have, um, they, even if they weren't lesbians, if they were accused of it, a school could remove them for that, and that sort of thing isn't uh, reported. And I think one of the biggest things that has, one of the biggest failures is that we've removed the control of the local authority, and therefore a lot of children don't realize, and parents as well, they don't realize that they can, they struggle to see who can I go to to talk to this about. You know, is it, and I think when I left, for instance, when I left when I was expelled for a camera, and the way that I ex was expelled was quite hard, <coughs> being only 15. I didn't realize that that was actually considered by most people to be inappropriate behavior, in a, in an inappropriate way to treat children. So there are double standards in the way that children are being treated, and it's, and, it, and it's not just to do, of course, with the headscarf, and just want to say, of course, lots of women, if they wish to wear hijab, that's their choice. But I think that when it becomes a uniform, if you have a group of 100 girls, there are going to be a chunk who don't want to wear that. And that is a fact. There's no way around it for me. So, yeah. So, would it be possible to just make a very quick point? I mean, I think I was misunderstood. Is that okay? Very good. Sorry, thank you very much. I don't mean that people should go out and reject their identity. I think the society and communities, let's say, in society, should reject the identity that they have been given by the authorities. I don't want, I, I, the thing is, I'm not asking anybody to go, can you please leave your religion and believe in what I believe? I don't care what I believe. I, I, you see, the moment, nobody knows what I believe in. Even Mariam doesn't know if I believe in Islam or does, oh, I don't, you know. It, that's not the point. The thing is, the moment I step out from my home, the society, the law, the council, every single official form I've been given, tells me, you are the Muslim. I'm like, look, can I please, can you please not call me a Muslim? I am a citizen. That's it. I, I, when, when I come to society, you must make me I think, I think this is, and I think if the society, if the Muslim population rejected this political and social identity they have been labeled with, then there will be no base for it for ISIS, for any other Islamic fascistic movement to come and recruit them. There will be no hanging out place for, like, I don't know, whatever it is. That, that was my yeah, point. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, my question deals with the issues of FGM and human rights and aggression, um, violence against women. So, I want to know if you think that the government in the UK is taking the necessary steps towards eliminating FGM and do you think that education is the only way to teach people about FGM and also um, if there's if you think that training in FGM should be included in teacher training in schools in the UK. 
we think we'll just hold all these questions to the end. Yeah. So next. Good next. Hi, uh, my name is Nathanena. I'm um, just a uh, few comments about just main speech. Uh, thank you for clarifying that uh, slide. <laughs> um, you said you 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 spoke about um, why the Muslim population didn't go out in the street against what ISIS is doing and what that's happening in Nigeria with Boko Haram. However, they went out in the street when Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre happened. And, and then at the end of your speech you said, well, Islam way too better. And uh, um, my point is, um, don't you think that Muslims uh, didn't go out in the street against ISIS or against Boko Haram because that's what they believe in? or maybe because they are afraid to face what they believe in. And I am not afraid of being called them Islamophobic. I don't care about that label. Well, I am Islamophobic, because that's what they call me. And, um, and the thing, I, what I found different is, when Charlie Hebdo ha happened, it happened in France, it doesn't, it, there's, a, there's a big difference like when it, something happens in Europe, when it happens in North Africa or in Middle East. What happened in the Middle East, in North Africa, nobody speaks. It's, you, they of course speak and oh, like what's happening in ISIS is wrong and so on, but then they go to the mosque, they pray and they preach what they are preaching and they say there are things in the Quran that's that like ISIS are applying what's in the religion. <coughs> And for you to say, in my opinion, that Islam is way better, don't you think you are betraying these people, like Yazidi women or the Nigerian girls, that um, the, or, or any person who's being killed by the name of the religion, and you say it's way too better? It's, I don't think it's way too better, because this is what the religion says. Yes. It's the religion that, again, is, um, it's the religion that uh, with uh, slavery, it's the religion that with execution of, of uh, an unbelievers, it's the religion that uh, could, uh, count women as half, it's the religion that um, abuse women, it's all in the religion. And I don't think it is a political religion because Religion, Islam is started as politics. It's for power. It's for for territories. Yeah, yeah. We cannot divide politics from religion. And I don't think Islam is way too better with what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa because that's what I see is Islam, and it's all according to the Quran. And I think that you, as you said, that you are a believer, believer, and it's hard to be a Muslim. I don't think it's hard to be a Muslim. It's hard to be an atheist. Um, <laughs> don't you think that you people need to face what's, what's written in the Quran and say, okay, we agree that this is so and so and so, however, we are not going to believe in it and we have to change it. Because if you did not change it and you say it's way too better, it's not going to change because it's, it should come from you, really. It should come from you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I have more of a comment, and it's directed at what Yasmin said. Um, um, I agree with a lot of what you said, actually, and um, I do identify with it as well. Um, but there are some things that I don't agree with. And what I'm finding is that a lot of South Asian people of Muslim heritage who are speaking out against Islamism um, tend to, I don't know about you, but in general, tend to come from a more affluent and middle class background where they, when they grew up they weren't really bound by many religious rules. Um, and um, you also made the point that there's this version of Saudi Islam that's being um, exported and it's eroding centuries of um, culture 
And to an extent, I, I do agree with that, but at the same time, not all aspects of culture are great. You know, if you come to my part of the UK, um, we've be, I've been seeing this all along. So not only were females subject to religious rules as well, they were bound by religious rules, but also conservative cultural values as well. Um, so I've always seen the headscarf worn on girls in school. Um, they uh, before it used to be very drab, black, black headscarf, and now they're more colourful and trendy. Um, girls were um, rarely allowed to finish their schooling, get an education, go on to university, and many of them would be forced into marriage or, you know, um, talked into an arranged marriage. Um, so, on the one hand. Yes, I think there is um, an Islamization going on, but at the same time, I think people ignore that. Uh, for for people like me, from where I come from, it's uh, it's always been like this. Um, and um, you know, not only were women subject to religious rules, but conservative um, conservative cultural views as well, where they also weren't allowed to wear um, Western clothing either because that was seen as wrong. So that's the problem that I have with, um, with this narrative being peddled by um, certain people from a South Asian Muslim heritage who say that, oh, it was so glorious back in, when we were growing up, we never saw any of this. But um, they might not have because of, they were from a more affluent background, but where I come from, we, we have seen this. Um, and they present the past as though it was somehow so glorious, whereas for some of us, it really wasn't. There were issues, like I said, forced marriages, the lack of education, and we seem to be ignoring that narrative. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mariam. Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to contact you through email. Um, I'm a researcher affiliated with Birkbeck University. And I had a more, more or less wanted to know your thoughts, uh, rather. So I would like to read something to you. Uh, the Quran clearly states this at chapter 2, verse 256. There shall be no compulsion in religion. I would like to know what are your thoughts on this. And a second part uh, question, which is, partially related to Sharia councils in the UK. Uh, the question is that Sharia law can never be implemented in the UK. This is something that is because the rule of law is what is observed. But women, Muslim women, need these councils to release themselves from religious divorce or they face They face marital captivity. There is perhaps a huge issue about culture being conflated with religion and confusion about the correct approach in Islamic legal rulings. Purpose of Islamic faith opens the doors to these issues along with Muslim along with Muslim feminists such as Amina Wadud, Kassia Ali, their interpretations to retrieve the gender neutral principle as it resonates within the Quran. I would like to know your thoughts on this, Mary. Okay, thank you. Okay. This will have to be the final contribution. Or are you waiting? Like, well, you're the final one. Okay, this is coming from someone who's of a scientific atheist background, so I can't claim to understand religious mindset. <laughs> this is not the only time I've seen this written. This translation comes from the Noble Quran, 191 to 193. And kill them wherever you find them, and turn them out of where they have turned you out. And our fitna, disbelief or unrest, is worse than killing. But if they desist, then lo, Allah is forgiven and merciful, and fight them until there is no more fitna, disbelief and worship ends of others along with Allah. The worship is for Allah alone. But if they cease, let there be no transgression against uh, transgression except against our excuse my pronunciation, Zaylumun, the polytheists and wrongdoers. The historical context of this passage is not defensive warfare, since Muhammad and his Muslims 
um, had just relocated to Medina, where they were not under attack by Moroc uh, Meccan advisory. In fact, the verses urge offensive warfare in the Muslims to drive the Meccans out of their own city, which they later did. So my question is, where's the separation between ISIS and Islam? Everybody who doesn't believe in that kind of stuff. Everybody agrees that terrorism is totally wrong. But where's the separation? I don't understand how you can read that passage in the Quran and say that that's not part of your religion when the Quran states you cannot admit anything, you cannot um, take it into context, and you cannot change the meaning. So I'd like to understand how a Muslim who doesn't believe in killing people, because a lot of everybody in this room doesn't, I like to think, how, how would you read that passage and admit it and still say that you believe the followings of Muhammad when he says you cannot admit any of his stuff, his stuff in there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, I'll be very quick. I have a very practical question, which is rather different from the discussion we've been having. I'm the, my name's Mike Flood. I'm the chair of Milton Keynes Humanists. We've been trying very hard to see if we could reach out to the Muslim community in Milton Keynes. Last weekend was an open day. We spent two hours in the, one of the local mosques. There are about four or five mosques in Milton Keynes. So, um, and um, it was a very interesting two hours discussion. We were very well received. My question to you and the audience is what can people like atheists and agnostics do to reach out to local Muslims to help them fight extremism? We're still trying to understand if we can do anything or whether we should just stay out of it. Because if there's any help, um, people could perhaps come to me during the day. Um, I'd just be very interested to know what we can do because we're very concerned. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite Miriam to quickly respond and then each of the panellists, but I could ask you please to be very brief because we are closing this session short. Because I have to be brief, I'm going to ignore the questions I was asked and try to bring them up in other issues. I do want to say something that, you know, just because Yasmin is Muslim, um, she's not responsible to respond to every question you have about Islam and, and Muslims in the same way that because I'm Iranian, don't come and ask me what the Iranian regime does and what's my answer to it. Well, I'll tell you to fuck off, okay? I'm sorry. But what I'm saying is that this plays into the whole concept of multiculturalism that this is the Muslim identity and now you are answerable for it. She's not. And the point of it is that we are all against the religious right whether we are believers or not. And the, there has to be a space within secular movements and groups for people who consider themselves believers. So I, I, I would hope that, Yasmin, you don't feel the need to have to respond to every little thing. But I do want to say one thing. There is a difference between live, real life, human breathing, human beings who think and, and analyze and interpret every text on the face of the earth in the way that they want. I hate religion. I think religion should come with a health warning, like cigarette boxes. Okay. But, but that does not mean that people don't have a right to believe in religion and that people who are religious cannot be the greatest free thinkers on earth. There are, they are. In the same way that you have atheists who are misogynist pigs, yes. you have Muslims and who defend women's rights and who stand and die for secularism. So I think it's important to see people as human beings, not as the identity that Islamists and multiculturalism imposes on them. A, a text like Islam, like the Bible, like the Quran, there is enough homophobia, misogyny, inhumanity in all of them. But people as living, breathing people choose bits and pieces as they want, and they live as 21st century human beings. They don't need to answer to what the Quran says, even if they're a yeah. believer. In the same way that an Englishman doesn't have to respond to every single accusation of colonialism and imperialism and the war, because he or she might be greatest anti-war fighter who is also against fundamentalism. You know, we are more than the identities that are imposed on us. We are human beings, and our politics decide our choices. And I will stand with Yasmin any day as a Muslim believer, and with Madele any day, even though they have different viewpoints, because our politics are the same. And it's a very human politics. And I'll answer the other things later.
I'm going to now invite each of the panellists to briefly respond to the questions that have been posed, the contributions made, and to sum up other points that they want to make. But I'm going to try and restrict you all to two minutes. <laughs> okay, I just, um, in terms of the Quran, there are aspects of the Quran which I think if you read it, you do think, oh, well, this is. Mm. I don't know what to think about this. <laughs> now, you have to remember that a lot of Muslims out there are born Muslims, but their understanding of Islam is really not very strong. They don't know much about it, especially in Britain. So most people will treat the Quran as sort of a book of like almost parables, like they'll take a, uh, a line here, or um, Allah said this, and Muhammad said that. So they don't deal with those verses in a day-to-day -day thing. And, most people are not going to sit there and uh, interpret it and be able to fight it. Naturally, we need to have reformists, and we have those reformists. So we have Majid Nawaz, he's trying to reform Islam. We have Amin Wadud, we have the um, Inclusive Mosque Initiative, and they're able to look at verses in the Quran which are difficult and offer different interpretations. But the everyday plodding along Muslim doesn't necessarily have to do that. And I think that is important to keep in mind as well. And um, naturally, I don't believe the Quran is perfect, but there are aspects of it which are nice. But I can see why people can take little bits and enjoy it in their day-to-day -day life. Thanks, Leah. Uh, yes, Okay, well, <laughs> um, thank you to Mariam. Right, a couple of things I want to make clear, as I probably didn't in, in the speech. I have worked 30 years tackling violence against women and girls alongside Pravna and Tanana and Geetha and others in this room. I have led a lot of the work on forced marriage, challenging religious and cultural interpretations. I am not calling for a better Islam, if that was anyone's understanding. I said very clearly I'm not defending Islam, I'm not recalling a glorious past, I'm not a reformer of Islam. My practice is my own private affair. And whatever it is based on is my own private affair. I do not bring that into my political activities. I do not, I'm a secularist for God's sake. I do not think that's an oxymoron. But I do not think that there is a, there is a place in the public sphere for, for religion. I think religion should be a private matter and that should not be state endorsed. That I cannot say strongly enough. Yes, Islam says some really horrific things. The Quran has some awful stuff in it. I've read it, I've been reading it since I was a young child. There is not a religious text that does not say something about slavery, about the subordinate position of women, about um, homosexuality. You take any religious text, it will have something that is negative within it. As for the title, I was being sarcastic. I thought I'd made that clear. I'd taken it from a country and western soul. <laughs> I was being you know, sarcastic, but you know, and it, I was also sort of using the language of the Islamists of God. It's so difficult being a Muslim in this world today because I, you know, I'm so victimised. I was. It was a play on words, and it was a play on a on a title. Um, I'm not calling for better Islam. However, people choose to practice it is their choice, as long as they do not perpetrate violence and abuse and discrimination and segregation in the name of the faith that I have been raised in. Here, here I think it's really important to reiterate the fact that secularism does not mean anti-religion. Secularism is about the coexistence of religious and non-religious. Um, and, and that's really, really important, and I cannot tell you enough how I felt just now. I'm so glad Mariam spoke up, because it, it was going to fall on Yasmin, um, which is ridiculous. Um, two things I want to make. This idea that, um, you know, it's only affluent, women of affluent background who challenge religion and, and actually... Uh, and, and religious dictates. That's simply not true. I've worked for 35 years with women who come from the most deprived, the most, you know, they're, they're the most marginalized women that, um, that are around, and yet they challenge and critique religion as they live it every day. Every day. That doesn't mean they're rejecting their identities. Most of them are believers. But what they are saying 
is that we challenge those aspects of our lived realities, which is a conflation of religion and culture, and, and they cannot separate it, and frankly, I can't separate it as it's lived. Um, they challenge those aspects of their culture and religion which they find oppressive, and they challenge those that prevent them from exiting from abuse and so on and so forth, right? That's not to say that they're challenging their whole identities. To them, their religion has some meaning to them. It might even provide some healing space for them, uh, spiritually speaking. That doesn't mean that they're not challenging. So it's not just affluent middle-class women from black minority communities who are challenging. We have a very rich history of critiquing religion as patriarchal text. And, and, as, and as Yasmin has said, we challenge these things and the justifications uh, um, based on them. Uh, particularly violence against women and so on. So Sharia councils um, and the idea that the rule of law, they can never be implemented, Sharia law can never be implemented. You bet it can't be implemented and if they try to, it will be over our dead bodies. That doesn't mean that they're not trying to and it doesn't mean that the state isn't trying to accommodate it. The state wants to privatize justice as it wants to privatize everything else, which is why we also have to have a critique of the state. It is vital that we have a critique of the state. It is colluding with the Islamists and the Hindu fundamentalists and every other fundamentalist because it likes nothing better than to vacate that space and let religion take its place. And religion, with its networks and its memberships and its resources, can do a far better job than little NGOs like mine in terms of providing services. But where, what those services are is another matter. And so the fact is that the state and these fundamentalists are trying to sh shariify um, law, privatize law. And it, has, it is having a detrimental impact on women. And the fact that these women are going to those places is not necessarily voluntary. It is done out of social compulsion. It is done out of pressure. The very people who want to stop them from accessing the legal system want them to go down this road so that they can impose a patriarchal sexual order again on those women. So it's really, really important that we understand that these Sharia councils are not, uh, uh, are not places of justice. They are actually contravening the rule of law. There is no due process. There is no rules of natural justice at play in these forums. And it's very important that we oppose them. Doesn't mean that we don't critique the legal system as it exists all sorts of other discriminatory, exclusionary processes that go on in those institutions. But it is important that we try and have a law that is based on human rights values for everyone, which means attacking multiculturalism, attacking neoliberalism, and attacking fundamentalism. No? Okay. So, uh, just, just very quickly, I, I, uh, just to reinforce the points that have been earlier made. Uh, personally, and that might sound paradoxical, I refuse to discuss religious doctrine because I think there is no point in whatsoever in discussing religious doctrine. People have a right to their religious texts, to their beliefs, and um, we have the right, if you are not religious or religious, to critique religion as such. It is Personally, at the risk of offending people, I find it extremely pointless to throw around a theological verses and then say, like, well, why don't you comment on that now? And why don't you tell me exactly, you know, what, 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 how Islam is great or not? This is the uh, anti-theist fallacy that religion, religious beliefs, and religion cannot be separated. My, I can say, I'm not from an Islamic background, from but from a Catholic background, and I can say from my own family, you can be a very, very devout religious believer, and still completely secular and even a secularist. This is completely possible. And um, as such, to say that religion is politics is of course true, but that also means that politics can be tackled as such. Religion as such, religious doctrine, religious 
beliefs, religious texts, and so on and so on, are separate matter. Whenever religion becomes politics, then we tackle it, like everything else we tackle. But not, we do not, I don't think we should tackle in any way uh, religious doctrine or text. And let me just make a prediction. Um, I think many atheists think that you know they, they're going to achieve secularism by converting everyone to atheism. I think this is completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> let, me, let me just make that prediction. We are not going to achieve a secular society without and against religious people. We need them on board for our secular agenda. Thank you. Okay, Park Silver Gate, but I don't know how big my students as you already got, but I want to go back to the first point because I think um, a few of the questions are getting lost in a few dominating questions. So the first point uh, and the question was that, uh, we, what can we do about FGM? Should, do we need some sort of education or uh, training? I think very briefly, yes, of course, we need some sort of training. But what I think is important is creating an awareness, building an awareness among, like we, what we are doing today is great indeed. We are a panel of mixed background and uh, we are claiming that we are against fundamentalism, we are all secularists and our audiences are claiming the same. But we are do sharing various views which actually show how distant we are actually. I know Mariam pointed out that we are friends and we are very close to each other but we are also distant in many ways which I'm coming in a moment. So that's for this reason, I think we need to do huge community work and that also answers to someone's question, an atheist friend, who said that what can the atheists do to help to come out of this trap? And I think this is what, actually, this is what I do. You know, you wouldn't find me a lot of time on social media. Uh, my great friend, Mariam, does the, all the tweeting and I go into Tower Hamlet's door to door and I get total you know, drained, exhausted, frustrated. I don't know how many days I cried back home for hours, thought, no, no more I won't go. I will not go there, but I do go back. And I need to know what they're thinking. What can I do? And I think this is what we need. I'll talk to you later how you can help. Like we invite our friends, Pradna Patil was there, Chris was there, he couldn't talk, but next time he will. Uh, Moriam will be coming on the 8th March. You talk, you share your views. You, you need to uh, bring them back to the light that look, atheists are not your enemies and you are not our enemies. We are trying to build something that is called humanity. Forget your religion, do it at home, no problem. And now coming back to your point, the second and very important, we already, everybody has answered. I want to just add a few points that the person that Yasmin who wanted to put a net label but failed quite well, uh, that she said she wants to put the label but she hasn't actually put the label on because she was an ex uh, wolf member uh, like me, I was a latecomer too and uh, both, I think I joined uh, in Women Against Fundamentalism online though uh, just when it started to fall apart and so my hope, I just came in UK in 2008 and then I joined and then from I think since 2009 it was just going down, down, down and it broke, my heart broke and but I still think that we, we are, will be getting somewhere, oh, many of our work members are here, senior ones. So I think the point that you question, but I think I quite agree with you when you say that do you not think that Muslim people are afraid of going out to protest in the street um, against ISIS and so. I think yes, you are right. Actually, I was quite afraid to go to that um, tribute thing in the Fra French um, embassy, you know, after the Sharia bill. You know what? Because I work with this women's group, they are just so blunt. They would have got me completely wrong. And perhaps Mariam has witnessed a few rubbish coming out and telling me that I am running this women's group called Nari Digun with Bengali women because I want to raise funds. Hello, I have done a whole PhD, spending £20,000 in gave to the UK government, can't I have a job? So that's the misunderstanding that we often get. But 
And, and also, that now coming back, that yes, I'm afraid, I don't want to go because I'll be hate, like the woman who died in Bangladesh. But trust me, your state and the, relig uh, the religion that you belong to, very bravely I'm saying, that Christian people wouldn't have come out when I would be chopped. They would come to go to express solidarity only after the surely everything happened. Uh, now, I'm, I'm just saying it, it not emotion from emotions. My friend in Tower Hamlets, you know very well, Ragnadi, that the guy, for four months he was in hospital, completely chopped out. He's an atheist and he announced it. But your, this state didn't give any, any security. The perpetrators are still hanging about. So, this is why I don't change or convert religion. But I have no no problem. Yes, I'm finishing. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I go coming back to Reza's point that the best way is to say we don't know anybody's religion. Everybody can have a completely different religion. Each person can have a different religion. But there shouldn't be any official religion that was imposed to me, like with my by God, I got being Muslim. So what do I do now? Well, I thank all our panelists today and those of you who made contributions and everyone here for listening and participation. I think I would just sum up this session very simply. Um, the struggle for secularism is a struggle for human rights, for universal human rights. To defend and support the victims of religious dogma and abuse, both victims who are religious and those who are not. And we defend these universal human rights values against all religious extremism. The proponents of Sharia law, the Islamists in this country who propose Sharia law, are knocking at the door. We must ensure that that door is kept firmly shut.